Thank you for tuning in and welcome back to the Sandwich of Coherency. So let's just go ahead and jump right into this. One of the things that we've been talking about has been the whole Roe versus Wade and this whole situation with the Supreme Court. And I promised I would talk about embryonic autonomy and that is what I'm going to do tonight. I apologize for the wait, but Let's just go ahead and jump right into this one. So, reading in a paper, The Public Disclosure, by the Journal of the Witherspoon Institute. Now, this is from January 24th, 2017, and it's titled Science, Embryonic Autonomy, and the Question of When Life Begins. And I just want to, you know, kind of just go through this real quick, because it's, uh, Pretty interesting. So, you know, it starts with the article, you know, when does life begin? According to the United States Supreme Court, a number of politicians, including President Barack Obama, and a variety of other sources, there is still much debate in the realms of science and medicine as to how to answer this charged question. A popular deflection is to say something like, it's above my pay grade to answer that, or if scientists are still debating this, who am I to speculate? And it's funny, it's, I think that's funny that we like to apply science and we must listen to it when it's convenient, and we must not listen to it when it's convenient. I guess it's just a matter of how you feel on that day. Now, I'm going to skip down to the portion, the autonomy of the embryo. And it goes on, if we define organismal autonomy to mean freedom from external control, it turns out that we can identify precisely when an embryo satisfies the definition of autonomy from the very beginning. Now, a recent study that was published by Marta and Shabazi and colleagues from the UK demonstrated that this newly formed cell knows what to do post-conception, regardless of whether or not it receives signals from a host uterus. Now that's just crazy to start with. I mean, the question does become, when does it begin? And this is, you know, this is interesting because we hear a lot of talk about this. But nobody has brought up this study. I don't hear about this anywhere. To I don't know. Maybe to me, I think this is something that really deserves more of a conversation. It might not be what people want to hear. And it, it really will put things into a type of perspective for people. You know, if the idea is that it is alive, what then? What then? Um, but what it goes on to say that, uh, let's see. Yeah, Shabazi and colleagues demonstrate in their study that a fertilized egg, also known as a zygote, the product of conception, the early embryo or one of many other descriptive terms is an autonomous living being. This one little cell with its complete genetic content can and does begin to divide and grow even in an experimental dish and an incubator in the closet space of some unmarked lab. This is crazy, you know. So, I'm mean, just a little bit more, um, you know, it just goes on to say that the embryos they used were fertilized, and they had been frozen after fertilization, and they were at various stages of first week pre-implementation development when they were thawed. Shabazz and colleagues then grew these embryos past the point at which they would normally implant themselves into the uterine lining using an in vitro culture system of their own design. They reported that these cells can successfully organize themselves despite not being implanted in a uterus. This means that, as we suspected, embryos know what they're supposed to do to live, and they try to live, whether they're in the mother or not. Huh. Huh. As the authors state in the paper, 
Their culture system allows human embryos to undergo their pre to post implementation transition in vitro in the absence of any maternal tissues. So this means that even outside the mother, the embryo tries to live. There is life there that is independent of the host. It has enough energy to do this, what it's supposed to do. It runs out of energy at a certain point because that's when it would normally be in the utero lining. But this is a clear, you know, an obvious thing that we really should be talking about. This changes the whole argument, in my opinion, if this study is solid and it can be replicated. To me, it changes the whole argument of when does life begin. And it's like I've I've said before, you know, there is a morality to everything. And I think we need, I don't know, more more implementations of such things to help young people and help people understand that Just because something feels great doesn't mean that you need to go diving head first, especially unprotected. There are consequences to certain things, and for the sake of pleasure, we have seemed to throw those to the wayside. There's a consequence with sex. There's a possibility of a child. That's like a major thing. Life is a product of that. There is a possibility that that could happen. You know, and that's just something that we've just decided, eh, if it happens, fuck it. we we'll just kill it. Now, this is not me saying that, hey, that's what you should do. I'm just saying this seems to be the mentality, the thought processes of many people. And again, like I said, I'm not trying to say either way whether or not abortions are good or not, whether or not you should or not. Again, like I've said before, I am a pro-life person. I'm willing to listen to the pro-choice side. And like I said, there are some things that they've said that I actually think they're on, on point with. But as I've said before, I cannot get behind everything that they say. And there's so much of what they say that I can't get behind that it's hard to want to be on their side for the few things that I do agree with because I know that the other things that I don't agree with come with that. So it's a hard place to be when it comes to those kind of things. And this is something, in my opinion, that needs to be talked about. But that's the bit for embryonic autonomy. It's, I don't know, I think it's really important. You know, there's not a lot of data on it to find. And so we're waiting to see and we're doing a little bit more digging to see what other studies there might be. But if we come across those, we will be glad to present them to you. But now let's continue on to the next interesting bit. And it seems to be, we're going to look at the Daily Mail, because right now, as if I'm sure many of you heard, there is a baby food shortage, baby formula, rather, and the White House, or the, yes, the White House administration is sending pallets of it in large quantities to border facilities to feed the children that need it of the illegal immigrants coming across the border. Is there a moral dilemma here? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Because one of the major major manufacturers has been shut down since earlier this year, that produces 40% of the American baby formulas. We have a shortage. This is not... New. This has been ongoing and it's ramping its way up and now it's people are really starting to feel it. This has been going on since earlier this year. 
The FDA has been slacking on their job, so inspections of this facility, the Abbott facility, have been slow. They're just not happening. And now they're talking about importing baby formula from other countries. Mind you, the import ratio of what we bring in is 2%. So 2% of baby formula is sold in the United States is imported. And that's because we, as terrible as some things may be with them, the standards for the FDA for importing that stuff tend to be pretty high. And one of the main reasons we don't import from other countries is because they don't even meet those standards. And the FDA standards really aren't the highest on things, if you really think about it. So if you can't even get your food in meeting the FDA standards, there's a problem. But they're talking about lifting those standards to bring more in. And I, I think that that's going to have m worse consequences than actually trying to fix this problem. But again, we have the problem of them sending formula down to the border. And the article starts off, you know, Jen Psaki slams Republicans who say border crisis is to blame for baby formula shortage, saying it's morally right to help babies in need. As Donald Trump says, Democrats should help American parents before sending $40 billion to Ukraine. And he is absolutely right. He's absolutely right. We have, you know, in that $40 billion bill is money set aside for food aid <laughs> to provide formula and food for infants and toddlers. This is what we're talking about. Yes, taxpayer dollars will be used to pay for that. But here's how that's going to work. Essentially, Rand Paul is pretty much correct. We're going to have to borrow that money from China, and U.S. taxpayers will be responsible for paying it back. The U.S. doesn't want to do anything to help the parents and the families in the United States that are having trouble finding formula, having trouble feeding their children, but they will honor the contracts they have and send baby formula down to the border using taxpayer dollars to pay for this. And I mean, look, they're breaking their backs to aid people that are trying to get into this country illegally. Some of them are genuine refugees, I understand, but let's be honest, the, you, the, the government is basically complicit with the cartel smuggling humans, this is human trafficking, and they're complicit in it. They're assisting this. And it just keeps going on and on, and they will keep taking resources and sending them there to deal with this, rather than honoring the Remain in Mexico policy. This is a, this problem of needing to feed hungry children who have come into the country illegally at the border is a self-created problem. It really is. And it's not to sound heartless and to say that, no, we shouldn't be helping people. Yeah, I mean, they did a lot to get here. And we should do something. They should have remained in policy. They violated the asylum clause. They skipped countries. You're supposed to apply for asylum at the first country of landing. So they violated that when they just, fuck it. No, we're just going to America. You, it's, it, the whole point of asylum is you're escaping. That's why you apply at the first place you go. It's not, well, we're trying to get asylum, but, you know, your country doesn't pay as well as what we're looking. So we're just going to try the next one. That's not how that works. And you have many people being branded and tagged by the cartels because they don't have all the money to get to and across the border. So they have to work for the cartels after they get here to pay it off. And the United States is complicit in letting it happen. 
And I'm, I'm sorry. I understand that there are really people that need some help, but the problem is that because we're not checking, because we're not doing our jobs, you're letting in so many more that aren't just coming to escape asylum. They're economic migrants. That's what it is. And they're economic migrants because their countries are being poorly managed. I know that makes me sound, oh, you sound so mean, but it's the reality. I mean, look, so Venezuela, I know people hate bringing it up, but yeah, I mean, that's a prime example. Because these things, you know, if you talk to many people, if you talk to people, you find out that the issues of what you're hearing about here are not just happening here. They're happening in other places as well. It's happening in Argentina. They're having the same kind of issues going on there. Same thing with Brazil. And these are places that are it's happening to where they are less financially set than the United States. So it's even harsher on them. And then once, you know, things don't go their way, people start making their way north. Eventually, they will make their way to the United States. And the reality is, no, they're not escaping for asylum. It's just that the money's better. And they're coming to take advantage of that fact. So, yes, the United States needs to be doing its job and keeping track of what's happening at its borders and taking care of its borders. This is not some racist rhetoric or anything like that. I know people may want to say that it is, but think about this. The United States, the White House and their last spending bill has money set aside to build border walls in other countries around the world for the specific purpose of stopping illegal immigration. Because of the financial, economic, and social impacts that it's having on their nations. Mind you, the Democrats, that is their bill that they approved. They sent money to other countries in the Middle East, a couple in Asia, to build border walls to protect them from illegal immigration. And then they turn and tell you... And we can't do that here. It is morally wrong to not accept anybody and everybody into your country. And the loudest people are the same ones, the celebrities and all of them, trying to lord themselves over the rest of society as if they are something special. And you have to ask yourself, how many hungry, starving people do they take in? How many do they take in? They're screaming, we need to bring them in. How many of them house refugees seeking asylum? These people trying to get a better life. None. You know why? Because that's bullshit and they don't believe it. <laughs> that's why. But, again, you know, these policies, it's just going to keep getting worse we have diesel shortages <laughs> shortages of everything and i feel for the people that don't live in agricultural states if you live in states that agriculture is not one of your main products you might have you're going to have some problems we really never fully recovered from the problems that happened during the pandemic <laughs> really, we we haven't, as far as stability of food across the nation. The only thing that's happened is really we've been able to, on the internal scale, domestically, shipping has begun to happen, trucks moving across the country. But farming is down, as I told you before, the United States winter harvest land was this as was as small as it had been in the past 100 years. So we're already low on crops to begin with. And since farmers are being paid more money to not grow crops, we're not growing crops. Which is why the blaming the lack of crops and lack of food and food shortages in the United States on 
the shit happening in Ukraine with Russia is absolute nonsense. This is a product of the White House administration. These are their policies and this is their effect. What happens in Russia and Ukraine has nothing to do with U.S. agriculture. Nothing at all. Unless you want to take into account the fact that if we're bringing in fertilizer from them, that's pretty stupid that the United States wouldn't produce fertilizer in its own country. This is the product with globalism. Believe me, for, don't forget other countries will take care of themselves first. No matter how virtuous you may feel, if you remember during the start of this thing when China was supposed to be shipping over these safety products, what did they do? They turned the ships around. Why? Because like they said, our citizens come first. Should have made your own, but you didn't. And we need it for our people, so you can't have it. Hence, you had shortages of things like masks and gloves in the United States. This is the cause and the results of globalism. When you outsource the basics of your nation to other countries, when things happen and things don't go well, you are left without. They don't make penicillin in the United States. Let's hope that we don't have any situations with that. And one has to wonder, what other medicines do they not make in the United States that are necessary for saving lives? You know, and so the idea is that bringing back jobs to the United States, bringing back companies to the United States, will create more jobs, which will create more funds moving through communities, which will improve the lives of everybody in the nation. But we can't do that. No, 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 no. We can't talk about doing that. We have to say that we're having our problems because of Putin and what he's doing in Ukraine. Holy shit. <laughs> I guess the next time Biden poops his pants on stage, that will, I guess that will be Putin's fault because he scared the shit out of him. I remember when Putin, when he did that video where he laughed and wished him good luck. It's almost as if he could see this shit coming. The president has put the United States into a very precarious situation. That $40 billion he wants to send has money set aside specifically for military equipment. Yes, that will probably be seen as the United States being involved in the conflict. There were implications to that and we'll have to wait and see what happens? But as I've said before, many of these people that are all so gung-ho about it weren't alive during the Cold War. They weren't alive during that situation. So, eh, they think that the people who were are losing their minds. But no, when you have a country that has over 6,000 nuclear missiles and is just dying to shoot one at the United States you kind of stay a little bit on your toes about it because you don't want your president to do the things that he's doing now because that could make us get to know one of those 6,000 nuclear warheads. And we'd like to not become best friends with them. I think I'm not alone in that sentiment. But we'll see what's going on come this election in November. If we can remove some of these demo rats out of office, then... We could have an easier time making it to the presidential elections, but, well, we got to make it to November. So, we'll see what happens. But I thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.